May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. This last Wednesday was the third anniversary of my ordination to the priesthood. And some of you here met me when I was a postulant, which is when I first started working as the director of the Mernet Fiscal Youth when I first started working as Youth Minister of Redeemer. I then became a candidate for Holy Orders, and I specifically remember sitting in one of the pews here on my last Sunday as a lay minister and making that announcement during announcements. And a few days later, I drove down to L.A. to be ordained to the transitional diaconate at St. John's Cathedral. And then six months after that, I drove down to L.A. again and was ordained to the priesthood. And that was on January 11th, 2014. And I actually had a very profound and emotional dream the night before my ordination. So please remind me to tell you about that sometime. That's a sermon for another time. <laughs> but today, I feel the Gospel, the Gospel of John, invite me to reflect on my three years of being a priest, specifically celebrating the Eucharist as a priest, and more specifically on one part of the Eucharist that I personally find to be especially powerful and provocative. So after praying the final doxology of the Eucharistic prayer, as I hold up the bread and wine, and say all this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, by Him, and with Him, and in Him, in unity, the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. How do you respond? You know what you respond? And you are welcome to actually open up your BCPs, your Books of Common Prayer, to around 365. I'm going to spend some time looking at some of this liturgy. What do you say in response after I say, All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever? You say, Amen. <laughs> and this is a very important Amen. Some liturgists call it the Great Amen. And many liturgists argue that this communal saying of the Great Amen is the pinnacle, the zenith of the entire Eucharistic prayer. And it is when the bread and wine become fully consecrated by all of us. So always remember to say that great amen with lots of vim and vigor. <coughs> now what do we do after that, after the great amen? <laughs> well, so that, that, is, right, that is all that is all you guys. But what do we what do we say together? Yes, we boldly say together the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us. And then what happens after that? I then lift up the bread and break it. It says breaking of the bread. And there are some rubrics associated with that part of the ritual. And there's one rubric that is not really, ex it's not really um, an option, it's expected. And most priests ignore it, including myself. And that is, um, I don't know exactly how it's written, but I think it's something like, a moment of silence is kept. Silence is kept. Mm -hmm. yeah. How is it written? A period, a period of silence. Of silence. A period, that's right. A period of silence is kept. <laughs> do, any, do we remember doing that? Do we, do we do that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Sometimes a little bit. It does say in our bulletin now that there's a brief silence. And I'm the one who's invited to hold that silence, and I find myself moving through it a little too quickly. And I wonder why that's the case. I also wonder why it calls for silence. There are some rubrics in the Book of Common Prayer that um, are optional. This one is not really optional. This is, this is expected. A period of silence is to be kept. Then after the silence, the priest does have the option to say or sing one of the many fraction anthems. And when I first began here as a priest a few months ago, we were using one in which the priest says, we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. And the people respond by saying, we who are many are one body, for we all share in the one bread. However, what does the Book of Common Prayer suggest as a fraction anthem for right to? Therefore, let us keep the feast. Right, it's called the, the Pascha Nostrum. 
in which the priest says, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Or, Alleluia, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. And then people respond, therefore let us keep the feast. Now, many find this anthem to be somewhat confusing and archaic, and even unsettling, <coughs> because it contains language of sacrifice, and seems to suggest that we have just sacrificed a Passover lamb upon which we will now feast. And often used along with this fraction anthem is the On You Stay, another fraction anthem, in which the priest says three times, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. And after the first two times, the people respond by saying, Good, have mercy upon us. And the third time, Yeah, it's, it's a little different. It's grant us peace. And today we're going to do that. We're actually going to sing hymnal S-161. We don't do it right now. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and again, this anthem seems to reiterate this idea that we have together sacrificed the Passover lamb. And I will admit that I find some of this language and the theology that's often associated with it challenging and disturbing. And yet, as I have been presiding as a priest for three years, it is this breaking of the bread and the subsequent sacrificial language that I find to be the most powerful part of the whole prayer. And I'm sure I will spend the rest of my life unpacking the multivalent meaning of these mysterious words and this mysterious act that we all participate in. But this morning I want to start at least unpacking some of the meaning behind these ancient liturgical assertions that Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us, and that the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. And if you invited to do this because our gospel reading this morning, we see John the Baptist referring to Jesus twice as what? As the Lamb of God. He says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Actually, he says, the sin of the world. This is the first title given to Jesus in John's Gospel after the prologue, after being called the Lamas, after being called the Word. He is then called the Lamb of God. This is also the only time in all of Scripture that this phrase, Lamb of God, appears. It is what <coughs> scholars call apoxlegomena. It is only said only once, which makes it especially difficult to decipher. And yet, New Testament scholar and Johannine scholar, Sandra Schneiders, believes that somehow everything is contained, like the oak in the acorn, in this foundational identification of Jesus as the Lamb of God. So what does it mean? Although scholars have puzzled over this phrase for centuries, they tend to agree that the author of John's Gospel has at least three Hebrew scripture references in mind when he says, Lamb of God. The first reference is to the lamb that was substituted for Isaac when Abraham was called to sacrifice his son on Mount Moriah, Genesis 22. And the second reference is, of course, to the Passover in Exodus 12, in which God commanded the Hebrews to sacrifice a lamb and then smear its blood on the lintel of the door so that the destroyer would pass over the house and not kill the firstborn of the son, or the firstborn son of that house. And I was thinking that this ancient ritual was not too unlike what we actually just did last Sunday when we chalked the lintel of our door, asking God to bless and protect this building and this community. And I'm glad we did, because a part of me thinks that they have protected the building from being flooded on Tuesday night. <laughs> so passed over this building. I got a call from Roy, who was confident that this building was going to be destroyed or flooded. But it was protected. And the third reference is to the suffering servant of Isaiah 52 and 53 who bore the suffering of an entire community and it was described as being led like a lamb to the slaughter. Now in all of these cases, the lamb is a vulnerable being who effectively combats violence and protects innocent victims. The lamb in Genesis 22 saves the life of young Isaac. The Passover lamb saves the lives of hundreds, if not thousands, of Hebrew children in Egypt. 
and the suffering servant saves an entire community. The Lamb combats violence not through more violence, but through completely non-violent self-giving. Violence cannot drive out violence. Only non-violent self-giving love can do that. Or in the words of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. The author of John's Gospel associates Jesus with the vulnerable and holy nonviolent lambs of Scripture that effectively halt violence and protect victims by giving of themselves. As I have said before, in Jesus, God reveals God's self to us as a vulnerable human being protecting other vulnerable human beings, not as a tyrant or business tycoon or king. He's not in the traditional sense that we understand a king. And just like the lamb on Mount Moriah, the Passover lamb, and the suffering servant, Jesus' nonviolent, self giving love does tragically result in death. And many others have followed in the same path of nonviolent, self giving love and have met that same fate. And this weekend, we honor a contemporary lamb of God in the person of Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther King Jr. was committed to peaceably protecting all victims. In fact, it was while working to protect victims of extreme economic inequality and extremely dangerous working conditions in Memphis, Tennessee, that Dr. King was assassinated on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel. A vulnerable human being protecting other vulnerable human beings through nonviolent, self giving love. These are the lands of God take away the sins of the world. And we are called to be these lambs of God. We are called to imitate and emulate MLK by standing up for the vulnerable around us, even if that means risking our own safety and well-being in the process. And we have an opportunity to emulate MLK and be lambs of God next Sunday afternoon by packing 10,000 meals for victims of extreme hunger. We'll be having people register for that after church today. There's also an opportunity this Saturday to emulate MLK and be a Lamb of God by participating in the Women's March, which will be held <clears throat> all throughout the world, but especially here in San Francisco, uh, Oakland, and San Jose. And this march stands for justice <coughs> and respect and inclusion for all, and I plan to be there wearing my clergy collar and representing all of us. And I invite you to join me as well. My wife, I'm sure, will be there as well. I'm sure because she insists I go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Probably. <laughs> as lambs of God, we are not some docile community of bleeding sheep. Bleating sheep. We are saints. As I define saints in All Saints Day, subversive agents inspiring nonviolent transformation. And the reason that we are able to risk our own safety and well being for the sake of others is because we are fed and nourished each week, every Sunday, by the divine Lamb of God who gives himself fully to us, who breaks himself open in the bread we share who pours himself out in the wine we drink, who takes away our sins and the sins of the world, and who invites us to abide and rest in him. Common theme throughout all of John's household. And it's first hinted to in our reading this morning. Our reading this morning includes the first words that Jesus speaks in John, which are a profound question. I usually begin my classes with asking students this question, which is two words in Greek, tizatete. <coughs> what is that word? What does that translate as? What is Jesus' question? What are you looking for? What do you seek? What do you seek? And the disciples respond by asking about Jesus' abode. Where are you staying? 
Jesus says, come and see, and abide in me. In order to be saints, subversive agents, inspire nonviolent transformation, and lambs of God in this world, we must abide in Christ. It is only by abiding in Christ that we can tap into that divine resurrection power that made a solid rock out of Peter, that made MLK continue to trust in the power of love even on the day that he was shot and killed, and that can make all of us shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, as our colleague says. And it is by resting and abiding in him that our deepest desires are satisfied. That is what we are looking for. As Augustine says, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. And when it comes to this sacrificial language, I, I still have a hard time with it. Popular theology asserts that God needs bloody sacrifice in order to appease his wrath. And there may be some truth to that. The Bible seems to suggest that. And yet I have a hard time with that. And as we were praying the psalm together, I felt like the psalmist, perhaps David, was wrestling with those same questions. And he says, you do not desire this kind of sacrifice. You do not desire killing animals or child sacrifice, human sacrifice, which is common in many uh, primitive cultures. But there is a different kind of sacrifice that we are called into. And I think the psalmist moves into this when he says, here I am. I am willing to do your will. No matter what that means. I'm giving myself fully to you, God, and to um, the vulnerable around me, around me, to protect them. That's the sacrifice I believe we are called to as saints and as lambs of God. And that's how Christ offers himself to us. And that's how he feeds and nourishes us each Sunday. So when I break the bread at the altar, let us follow the rubric. Let us observe that silence for a moment. And help me to hold that silence as well. And in that silence, let us enter into that resting and abiding and being nourished by Christ the one who breaks himself open for us, and the Lamb of God who takes away our sins and the sins of the whole world, and who nourishes us and empowers us to be lambs of God in our world today, to be like MLK. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Respond. Grant
how great your wonders and your plans for us. There is none who can be compared with you. Oh, that I could make them known and tell them. They are more than I can count. Let your love and your faithfulness keep me safe 